Welcome to The Art of Conscious Living. Today I have a very special guest, Norman Solomon. He's talking and we're going to speak about today about the art of conscious politics. Norman, how are you today? Oh, pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to go back to the very, very beginning when you were not in politics and you were a young man. Take you very, right back to that time. What were you thinking and why did you enter into politics? I was really trying to figure out what is important in life, what I would care about enough to put my energy and my feelings and my whatever talents I could muster into the effort. And over a period of time in my late teens and 20s, I didn't think of myself as, myself as being in politics per se, but what do I care about? What is compelling to me? And that brought me to what we call civil rights or challenging a war at the time of the Vietnam War and made me think more broadly and I think deeply about what does it mean to be a person and how can we connect to each other in meaningful ways. And what does politics mean to you today now? Looking back in hindsight, you are coming from the right place. You have the heart and the mind and the intention. I'm going to refer to a film of 1939 and this film is called Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, James Stewart, 1939. And this was a film that was very, very compelling, talking about special interest groups, the lobbyists, the corruption of Washington, and this young senator going to Washington and finding himself all around evil all around him. It was not no longer government for the people, about the people, but it was about all of just for the government and not caring about the people. And this movie was monumental and it's as true then in 1939 as it is today. Well, we really are back to the future. I mean, that visceral feeling that humanity, that people's well-being uh, get trumped by these very entrenched huge interests, I think that's a common feeling. The question is often, what are we going to do about it and how do we bond together as human beings to create the kind of society and world that we believe in, uh, you know, create that as much as possible. And uh, to me, it's really about humanistic values. I mean, I, I start from the place of values, if you will, morals, uh, a word that has sort of gotten a bad uh, name in a sense, uh, because morals are sometimes used to hit people over the head. You should live this way, you shouldn't live that way. I'm talking about the deeper and broader sense of values and morals where we want children to have nutrition, uh, health care, education, housing. We want the environment to be protected. We want our resources to go into nurturing life instead of destroying it. We want to defend the ecology of the planet. Those are basic values. And we live in 2011 at a time when, more than ever, I'm afraid, corporate power, the anti-values in a way of greed is good, of Wall Street, of if you have the biggest military, you can just sort of stomp your way through and get your way on the global stage. These are conflicts, I think, between um, the humanistic values, which I and others sometimes call progressive politics, and the, the politics of greed, of power, of concentration, of uh, uh, corporate entities into fewer and fewer hands too much power in too few hands. So in a way, just to sort of summarize, I see it as uh, democratic possibilities from the grassroots, uh, challenging the suppression of those possibilities, uh, the suppression coming from corporate power and what Martin Luther King Jr. called the madness of militarism. And you are all about grassroots, of working from the bottom up and making a difference and that making of the difference is coming from basic goodness, as I understand you say. Well, that's my, my, my feeling and in my experience over the years of the last few decades, being involved in the civil rights movements, the anti-war movements, the green sustainability movements, uh, bonding with other people to realize that uh, gender, race, economic class, nationality, ethnicity, religion, those are categories and boxes uh, that are transcended by our common humanity. And that isn't just a platitude, then it has to get down to how do we change policies to nurture our commonality and connect with each other. Some may call it uh, political, some may call it spiritual or even theological, but what it comes down to is nurturing and caring for human beings, whether they're one day old 
or whether they're 100 years old or anywhere in between, uh, they all are part of our uh, human commonality. And so often the policies that are implemented are about profit, they're about war, they're about concentrations of power, whether it's an organization, a corporation like PG&E or a big military contractor. These are basic uh, choices that we make, not only as individuals, but as governments, as society. Norman, was there a decade in hindsight that you think was absolutely working or worked as close as to as the best it could? And which president would you think was really a president that you would have liked to have been totally behind? Well, I think that all eras have tremendous problems. Unfortunately, we've always had poverty, we've always had war. That in no way justifies either one of them, but it's to say that in every era there have been challenges, there have been injustices. So I don't go back to sort of a, a golden era. But I do think that there are social movements that have been elevating, that have had, we might say, consciousness of spiritual transcendence that have galvanized our human possibilities. The civil rights movement was very spiritual and it was very political and it had a capacity to draw us together. At its best, the anti-war movements, the environmental protection, women's rights, gay rights, the capacity to embrace each other and say, we don't just have to take what is dealt to us, we can create a different and more nurturing sort of society. I would say in looking back, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, because he was a president who embraced what became known as the New Deal and embraced the social movements for uh, low-income people, for working people, for those who tried to raise their families in times of desperate poverty. Um, Roosevelt was a president, I think, who is a model for putting values above economic power. And let's remember, the guy grew up very rich. And the very wealthy people at that time in the 1930s, some of them in the corporations and the leaders of the corporations of the era, some of them called him a traitor to his class. Why did they say that? Because he put humanity above just massive profit, profit taking by Wall Street. So that's a good model. You know, he said, um, there are these economic royalists, these were his terms. He said, I believe in the commonality of human beings to create a better society. Well, you know, if you're going to take that position, you're going to make some enemies. And, you know, I've only recently gotten into electoral politics. I've been a writer, an organizer, a journalist uh, for several decades. Now I'm moving more into the electoral arena. I'm running for the U.S. Congress here in the North Bay for a vacant seat. And to me, those values of social movements for progressive change need to be infused into the electoral process and into Congress. I think he had a very strong woman, uh, Roosevelt, <laughs> Eleanor Absolutely. Roosevelt. Absolutely. Eleanor Roosevelt was a visionary who knew that to fulfill the vision of a humane society, you have to fight like hell sometimes. Mm. With love in your heart, and resolution and determination. You don't simply put out your ideas and say, oh, well, we'll just see the way it goes. You push every day and push really hard. And to me, that's a role model. Who else do you admire in politics right now? Who's in Washington who you feel that you could align with? Well, I feel very aligned with Lynn Woolsey, uh, who's now in her last term in the U.S. Congress from the North Bay. Mm -hmm. And I was very honored that just uh, a couple of weeks ago, when she sponsored a peace rally in downtown San Rafael, she invited me to be one of the speakers. And I, I talked about what I learned when I went to Afghanistan and the healthcare not warfare campaign that I've co-chaired nationally. So Lynn Woolsey, uh, Barbara Lee, uh, John Conyers, who I co-chaired the healthcare not warfare campaign, along with, I should say, Donna Smith, who uh, you may have seen in the film Sicko, who's now with the California Nurses Association. Congressman Conyers and Donna Smith and I co-chairing that healthcare not warfare campaign has really, to me, certainly been elevating for my own awareness that if we stand for something, that we want everybody to have access to healthcare, quality access, full access, adequate healthcare, it changes the way that our values are enshrined in our budgets. And really, you know, we all know the expression, uh, put your money where your mouth is. We've got to, in terms of government spending, put our money where we say usually our values are, and that is to take care of children, take care of our parents and grandparents as they age. That's really what a humane society is about. So society would be based on their humanity. Essentially, 
Where do you think we are at right now in the way of the government? Do you think they are looking towards the future or are they presently looking back in hindsight and very much locked in the present? Meaning in the future, we have a global world here. It's no longer one society dominating the other societies. It's no longer the warfare that was happening, wars that were generating money. It's a new paradigm of being now and the future is very obvious that with the information age that we're in, all of that is changing. Do you think the government right now is prepared for this and looking at that? A lot of government isn't even really functionally about the present, it's more about the past. It's more about a trajectory, a trajectory which frankly is a negative and often deadly trajectory. Let's look at global warming. Uh, we have to wake up that these incremental changes, these minor tweaks, are not going to do it. We have tremendous climate change, which is human cause. And unfortunately, many who have gotten to Washington, even saying, oh, this is a climate crisis, have pretty soon caved into the coal and the oil industries and put it on the back burner, saying we can't make major change. We have to tax carbon at its true cost to society, bring way down the consumption of carbon, the uh, uh, grass, uh, get, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and so forth. That's just an example of how we have to live in the present and look to the future and in a way just to sort of sum up and answer to your question, we've had so much of this sort of attitude on Wall Street that has filtered into dominating Washington which is think of the next quarter the next few quarters, the next election. Meanwhile, we are heading over a cliff in terms of uh, lack of jobs, environmental degradation, uh, lack of the sort of future that can sustain life on the planet. Well, there's two thoughts that are happening right now, speaking to what you were speaking about of the environment. Al Gore had his thought, and there's a young gentleman from Denmark who is basically saying, no, all those things that Al Gore is speaking about is incorrect. Mm -hmm. If we follow that, you're basically, it's a drop in a bucket. So he's come up with a solution of what possibly could be done in the way of how to spend money in the most effective way. And it's basically not so much as that we are overusing and heating up the planet. Mm -hmm. It's basically that we can cool the planet down in a different way though, of, in a way of business from business that would make business sense? Well, I would say that Al Gore is on the right track and that we have way too much consumption. That doesn't mean that we go back to um, the olden times, but it does mean we use technology uh, more creatively and also realize, uh, as Jackson Brown said at a No Nukes concert, as I recall decades ago, appropriate technology doesn't kill people. So it's not high technology if that technology, whether it's nuclear power or it's oil or it's coal, is actually destructive to human health. That, you know, there can be all these gizmos that can look very high tech, but at the end of the day, what it's doing to human beings and doing to the ecology of the planet, that's the bottom line. That's what matters most of all. I really believe in conservation. I believe that if our technologies and our political economy are put to use to conserve energy, you know, the cleanest kilowatt is the one that we don't use. And there's been way too little emphasis on that because it's not so profitable. On Wall Street, they don't wake up in the morning and they say, well, let's figure out how we can have more conservation of energy. No, they're into selling products, uh, saying, no, you can use more, buy more, consume more, emit more. Uh, that is a prescription for disaster. Conservation is a, uh, not only a humanistic, it's an ecological way to realize that we are part of nature. We can't just produce and plunder our way into nature. That is taking us where we've been and where we are now, which is degrading our own environment, fouling our own nest, attacking Mother Nature. That has to change fundamentally. Absolutely. So in the essence of saying that we need to become non-oil dependent, and it's going to happen, but it cannot happen immediately because the whole grid and the whole economy would collapse. So for what period of time would this happen, and what percentage would be solar, wind, and other? Yeah, well, Amory Lovins is a great visionary author and analyst who for several decades now has been talking about the great potential of conservation and so forth. The short answer is as soon as possible. 
ASAP because we are in a crisis. The global warming is a crisis. And so when you're in a crisis, when you're heading towards a cliff, in a sense you don't say, well now how can I gradiate the use of this brake? You use the brake as strong as you can without putting yourself through the windshield, right? You do it in a way that's as safe as possible, but understanding and taking into account clearly the extent of the peril and the imminence of the peril. So I would say we need a crash program. We had a Marshall Plan for Europe uh, right after World War II. We had before that a Manhattan Project to develop a nuclear bomb. We had a crash program in our lifetimes to get somebody, a human being, on the moon. We need a crash program for energy conservation, solar and wind, the exact mix. I don't know what that'll be. I think nobody really knows, but we need to find ways to A, conserve, B, retrofit our existing homes, C, insulate in many different ways, homes and businesses of all sorts, cut down on the use of electricity for all sorts of purposes, changing the grid uh, structure of pricing so that the more use from one user becomes extensively more uh, expensive to discourage any squandering of, uh, of energy sources. And then we need huge public investment in solar and wind and other conservation, uh, conservation measures such as insulation. So stuff isn't going out the windows, isn't going out the smokestack, uh, so to speak. So uh, bottom line, we have to take this totally seriously as a crisis and it takes money. You know, the U.S. government is now spending one trillion with the T dollars every year on the military. We could cut vast proportions of that. It's way, way, way over two billion with the B dollars a day spent on the military. Much of that is not legitimate defense spending. It's boondoggles. It's again what Dr. King called the madness of militarism with these wars uh, from Iraq to Afghanistan to Libya and on and on. So I think that there's a direct correlation there. Just as healthcare, not warfare, we need energy conservation and true green sustainability, not the warfare state, which is a death spiral. My thinking is that the United Nations, uh, they get together and they meet and they work out a consensus of, of how they can work with each other, how they can help each other on a global level. Has that been lost in translation at one point in time? Because it seems to me that so much could be done there. It could be an incredible think yes. tank there yes. that we could all join together as, as, a, as, a, as a global welfare for each other. Yeah. And so much possibility could be there. Instead of everybody saying, no, we are America, this is China, this is, this is Japan, and everybody isn't isolated. But we are not isolated, absolutely. So what really happens there at the UN? Well, I think, as you say, we could say metaphorically, a lot has been lost in translation. The founding of the United Nations, actually in San Francisco in 1945, was a vision of a different sort of world with global cooperation. Mm -hmm. Not only mutual understanding, but uh, mutual joint enterprises to make the whole Earth uh, more life-sustaining and to uh, mitigate the dangers of war. Eleanor Roosevelt, who you alluded to, central to that entire project in the mid-late 1940s. Uh, one of the main problems is that the United Nations has been increasingly dominated uh, by those superpowers, and now, to a large extent, uh, Washington and other of the most powerful countries, symbolized by the Security Council. So you have uh, just a few countries dominating what is essentially a world body, and the bottom of the pit was reached during the George W. Bush administration we had people like John Bolton and other top officials of the uh, U.S. government denouncing the U.N. and saying, well, it's no good if it doesn't do exactly what Washington wants it to do. Well, that's a perversion of the concept of the United Nations, and it's really hampered the capacity of the U.N. to have genuine peacekeeping forces because the U.N. is perceived, and unfortunately, often quite correctly by folks around the world, as a tool of the United States. That's not a way to go, and it's not a world body, it's an instrumentality of the most powerful government, which is what the world, I think, on the whole, is trying to get away from. That's the concept of the UN. So I think we can improve it, but it means a rethinking and reframing and being supportive of the UN as truly a global body. In a near-perfect world, how, how would you think and what would it be uh, in the perfect 
way of the government taking care of the people and different countries supporting each other and helping each other. What would that be? What would that look like? Well, I think a, a near perfect world would not, for instance, be spending so much on armaments. The United States, unfortunately, the largest by far arms manufacturer and exporter around the world, especially selling weapons around the world. The United Nations can and should insist on more resources going to uh, abatement and elimination of lethal diseases, uh, nutrition programs, neonatal programs, ways in which our global wealth can be provided directly to those who are in jeopardy for them and their children and the elderly of the world because of the vicissitudes of life and the hazards of not having adequate health care and nutrition and resources. That's really the UN mission. And a, a very a tiny part of the resources of the UN and particularly of the member states and the most affluent ones, uh, very little of that is really going to um, help people around the world. And so it's a, I think the mission has to be flipped uh, so that the UN pioneers around the planet putting people and their health and well-being first. So on the flip side, let me just say, on the flip side, unfortunately you have an agency that's affiliated with the UN, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency. They claim to be looking out for nuclear power plant safety. In fact, they have been promoting nuclear power plants. And that represents the policies of the governments like France, uh, until recently, Germany, Britain, the United States, they all been pushing nuclear power plants. And then they say, we're going to regulate this. This has enormous implications for nuclear weapons proliferation. So again, you have a UN agency. The UN should not simply be representing the corporate and military interests of the most powerful member states. The UN should be looking out for humanity. So I'm hearing that this is the conscious politics that is so much needed. This is the present politics and looking towards the future. Everything you're saying is different than what has been happening. There's a saying that war is big business. And all through the decades, if you look back in the past, it's making money from war. And this is no longer the way to be in this world now. I'm hearing a very strong message of what you're saying, Norman, that it's time now and to look to the future to say no. We are here to, yes, create business and, and have economy continue, but to create it from a different way of being in this world today. Well, I, I don't think I'm naive. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a pacifist, but I do want to say this. We face a fundamental choice, as Martin Luther King said, between nonviolence and non-existence. If this world relies on violence with the tremendous weaponry that we have on this planet, that is a pathway to destruction and to take down and um, crush the lives of, of young people now and the next generations. I would say that consciousness is absolutely crucial and it's insufficient. Just as plowing the ground, if you want to grow crops, is crucial but insufficient. With consciousness, we plow that ground. But without action, consciousness is not going to get us very far. I think connecting the consciousness and action, political activism, is absolutely crucial. And one without the other just won't do it. What final thoughts would you like to share that you feel that you would really like to share with your audience? Well, the discourse, the discussion, the, the questing, the thinking and sharing of, of, of thoughts and of emotions, it's absolutely crucial. That needs to be ongoing. and. I just underscore uh, what I was mentioning that political activity doesn't need to be um, negative or sordid. People say, I'm not into politics. Well, fine, but when you turn on the tap and drink the water, literally the politics is into you in that what comes out of the tap is the result of political action and inaction just to protect the water on the planet. So that's really why I'm running for Congress here in the North Bay. And that's why I believe that political action put together with progressive values and consciousness, that is really our best hope. Well, thank you, Norman. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, well, thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. And from the Art of Conscious Living, thank you and take care of yourself. <laughs>